Hello and welcome to this Halloween special IP Espresso podcast organized by the Southeast Asia Intellectual Property SME Help Desk. Um, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, the Help Desk is a, it's an initiative funded by the European Commission that supports SMEs in the EU and other countries in the single market to both protect and enforce their IP rights in Southeast Asia. Now, our team provides information and first line support uh, and those services are both free and confidential. Now, the team of experts is based in Vietnam, and they can answer any of the questions you may have about intellectual property in the region. Uh, and our website also has a wide collection of fact sheets and case studies about managing IP uh, in the area. Now, the website address is www.sea-iphelpdesk.eu. Um, in this episode, we're bringing you some intellectual property horror stories. Um, we've asked our IP expert to tell us about some of these IP scenarios gone wrong. Um, we will look then uh, at how they can be avoided uh, and why protecting your intellectual property is crucial, um, especially in the very attractive uh, but challenging market like Southeast Asia. Um, and without further delay, um, just uh, seeing the Nick is up on the screen uh, and Nick is joining us today. Nick, can, can you hear me? Yes, there we go. Can you okay. hear me? And I can hear you just fine. Great. Yeah. Great, Nick. Um, I, I hope you heard my intro. Um, I was just saying about what we're going to focus on today. Um, before we go any further, please, could you introduce yourself to, to the audience here? Great. Thank you. Um, yes, my name is Nick Redfern. I'm a principal at a firm called Rouse. We're an IP consulting firm. Uh, we specialize in Asia and uh, I work in Indonesia, which this is the capital city of Indonesia, Jakarta. But I've worked throughout Southeast Asia for the last 20 years or so. So uh, in multiple countries and uh, hopefully can tell a few stories from different places in Southeast Asia. Yeah, super. Thank you. So yeah, we're, we're, we're Halloween today. So the, the focus is to try to scare our audience a little bit. Let's let's see how if we can succeed in doing that. Um, so to kick us off, what is so scary about doing business in Southeast Asia then? Well, there are, I suppose, if you take the ASEAN region, which is in the ASEAN is the kind of the equivalent of the European Union for Southeast Asia, you've got 10 different countries. And uh, that means essentially 10 different legal systems. There is a lot of harmonization of IP, but still each country operates differently. And, you know, there are different challenges in different markets. Yeah, right. I see. And if we were to, you know, loosely do a kind of leak table, where, what would you put at the bottom of the leak table? What's the scariest place to go to? Where's the, where's the place where companies pay real attention to making sure they don't go in unprepared? Yeah, I think it, it sort of rather depends on uh, the commercial aspirations of the companies. It's, it's a little bit difficult to say one is more difficult than another. Um, people tend to worry about Indonesia because it is the biggest country by a long margin in Southeast Asia. Literally half of the population of Southeast Asia live in Indonesia. Right. What is the population that, of Indonesia? How, how large 200 is it? And 275 million or thereabouts. Yeah, so we're almost, we're, we're more than half of the EU market in just one, yeah, one country. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Mm. Um, but of course, not everyone's trading in Indonesia. You know, if you are uh, running a regional operation out of Singapore, then it's absolutely critical you get things right in Singapore. Um, yeah, it depends, you know, if you're manufacturing, probably more technology manufacturing takes place in Thailand, Vietnam, Malaysia. So that might be a more you know, serious issue for you to make sure you get things right in that market. So it very much depends on how your business is trading in Southeast Asia. Yeah, it's okay. And I, I suppose, no, our focus is SMEs, of course, but I suppose that this is some, uh, some of the difficulties faced in these countries are, are also faced by some of the largest companies, uh, European companies. Absolutely. Absolutely. If we wanted to talk about multinationals, I could tell you the horror story about the sort of uh, the fake stores belonging to fashion brands in Indonesia or, you know, the counterfeiting that flows over the border from China into Vietnam. So there's kind of big problems that have to be dealt with by multinationals and governments, to be honest. Some of those problems can't be solved by quick fixes to the IP system. Some of them have to be dealt with at uh, sort of international level. Yeah, right. I, I lived myself in China some years ago now, and I remember going to the to the market at the weekend when I wasn't teaching English in a secondary school and seeing the the buckets of Louis Vuitton bags and and yeah. things like this. So, uh, and I think people who have visited the region will 
or maybe uh, that will sound familiar to them as well. But yeah, as you say, today is, is the focus is, is SMEs. Uh, we don't want to go into uh, those larger companies. Um, and, and so we're going to focus on a couple of case studies which are useful in terms of highlighting some of the issues the companies face, some of the dangers, some of the remedies, some of the ways to prepare for, the, for those, um, those expansions into, into Southeast Asia. Um, the, the first case study we wanted to touch upon was, was this Lazada versus First News. Um, and I wonder whether you could just tell us a little bit about who Lazada is and, and who First News is. Yes. So um, Lazada is one of the largest e-commerce platforms in Southeast Asia. It's present in quite a few countries. It's owned by Alibaba, ultimately. <clears throat> and um, this is a, a copyright uh, case. And First News is a local Vietnamese publisher. Now, they have the license rights to a number of international book publications, and so they're authorized to print translations in, in Vietnam. So they're not a huge company, you know, mid-size perhaps. So this is an example of a kind of problem that uh, companies face who companies that own copyrights. So it, it will be the same with music and other kinds of rights as well. Now, there's a well-known, well-documented problem in Vietnam of fake book publications. You can find them in the streets of uh, Ho Chi Minh and Hanoi. Uh, I, I remember years ago, you could you could always see these sort of photocopied books around the streets. And, and, and that's been continued for many, many years. And First News um, ran a, a sort of publication. They, 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 a few years ago, they, they ran a kind of event and, and they sort of showcased some 700 books that they said were available on e-commerce platforms in Vietnam. This was just before the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And um, e-commerce had really taken off. You know, it was booming. It has since exploded and is a far, far more significant outlet for all kinds of consumer goods all across Southeast Asia. Um, yeah, I was going to ask you about this nick uh, in, in particular so e-commerce has kind of changed the game of, of intellectual property hasn't it could you, could you yeah. say a little bit to that yes it has i mean uh, the, the the pandemic supercharged something that was growing already in southeast asia um and pretty much today every major country the single biggest outlet for consumer goods is e-commerce platforms like lazada shopee uh, Facebook marketplace and then there are a number of very big ones in Indonesia that are domestic Tokopedia and Bukalapak and those are huge companies in their own right because Indonesia is such a large market so yeah. e-commerce is, is down here as you say yeah, yeah it's and kind of, as you say there are more of them than, than say the UK where Amazon tends to dominate but there are a large number across different markets in in Southeast Asia yeah, in the same way that we saw all the Amazon boxes stocked up on our streets during COVID and seeing that everyone had changed their purchasing habits, that obviously happened in, in Asia as well, where they often had even stricter lockdowns than we did, I think. Um, that's very interesting. And when you when you talk about, so Alibaba is an example of one of these mega platforms, is it? just in case any of our audience don't know, Alibaba is, is one of the biggest in the world now, if not maybe the biggest, I don't know. Probably is the biggest because they own a number of uh, subsidiary ones like Lazada in multiple markets. Yes, right. Okay, so so this was a subsidiary then of Alibaba, uh, functioning in 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 Vietnam uh, and yeah. First News. So, what exactly was the case that First News brought to the authorities in Vietnam? So their complaint was that Lazada essentially was assisting the commission of copyright crimes. You know, they weren't the primary infringer. Um, they're what's called a secondary infringer. Now, the law is a little bit technical here, but essentially. The secondary in acts of secondary infringement are where you are helping or assisting uh, somebody commit the primary infringement. And the argument is that Lazada was assisting these merchants selling all these counterfeit fake books because First News had already reported this. They, 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 they said, look, all these books are widely available. You've got to do something about it. Nothing had been done about it. And therefore, they what they wanted to do is to file a civil court case saying uh, Lazada is secondarily liable for the crime of copyright infringement because they're assisting the commission of the crime. Now, this is sorry, my headset fell out. This is a sort of technical argument, um, but it's one that works in Europe. It works in North America. Um, even China has reasonably well established secondary liability rules. Now, most countries do. And that's why this concept was kind of, it was relatively new to Vietnam. And there were laws that said that this should be the case, but there were very few cases. And that's, that's 
one of the problems in certain countries, particularly in Southeast Asia, is if there are very few cases, you're you're kind of bringing test cases to to show how the law should work in practice. I see. And that so was where they ran into pioneering law in Vietnam, in a sense. You're you're breaking ground and and helping judges and lawyers there and prosecutors there to to deal with these issues maybe for the first time. Exactly. Yeah. And that is one of the problems in almost all of the Southeast Asian countries um, like Vietnam is if you want to try and bring a case against a platform, you're going to be one of the first people to bring that case in many of the countries. So that is a big challenge. It Obviously, bringing a civil case is a hugely expensive uh, exercise. Um, mm -hmm. You don't know because there are not many cases. You don't know what damages levels you can recover. And in many countries, certainly the non sort of developed common law countries by which i mean singapore and malaysia where at least costs are usually recovered some level of costs can get recovered in civil law countries like vietnam philippines thailand indonesia legal costs are very rarely recoverable so you've mm -hmm. got to commit a huge amount of resources to bring a civil case which is essentially what what uh, um this uh, litigant had to do that they had to fund this on their own and you know, it, it turned out to be a very tricky and complicated case. And First News filed it against Azada in the Ho Chi Minh city. Ho Chi Minh is, is, is also known as Saigon in the, mm -hmm. in the district people's court. They've heard a few copyright cases before, but not many. And not many specifically on this issue of what's called secondary liability of uh, e-commerce or Internet platforms. Yeah, and so I, I could see why this is so scary as well. But I mean, obviously, you bought these licenses in the hope of you know selling these these titles in in a very large market. You know, Vietnam is a is a is a uh, country with I think over eighty million people. If I'm not if I'm not wrong, so it's a huge market. You've made that investment. You're you're publishing. You're you're printing uh, books, and and then suddenly you see that you're being undercut uh, in the market. So so it's a very it's a very difficult position to be in. Um, how did how did it go for First News? How, you know, when it went through this process and breaking ground in the Vietnamese uh, justice system, how, how did things turn out for them? Not very well, unfortunately. Um, they right. ran into all kinds of technical problems during the case. Now that there are the precise details aren't exactly known because there was no published judgment. The case just came to an end, and it's not clear how. It's possible they filed a case and found that they were. There were technicalities like the fact that they were not the original copyright owner, but a licensed publisher. Um, Lazada didn't cooperate. Uh, mm -hmm. I know of other cases where they've also taken a, a backseat rather than actually uh, respond formally and get involved in cases. They tend to prefer to wait and see and do as little as possible because they a don't bit, want to. A bit like a ghost, shall we say. They can, they yeah. can just disappear when they need to be there and reappear when you don't want them. It's a... Uh... <laughs> that's one of the challenges one of the halloween challenges of litigation is yes <laughs> litigants the other side doesn't necessarily cooperate and appear and help you and so this case sort of petered out they they you know we we heard in a couple of years i think it was a year or so after the case started that there were some hearings and then uh, lazada had applied to not attend one of the hearings um they argued there wasn't sufficient evidence and, and the case petered out and, and obviously first news had spent a lot of money on that at that point mm. for whatever reason it didn't work out you know i wouldn't like to speculate exactly why but it's one of the challenges of civil court cases is is it's really hard to bring them they're expensive and difficult especially in countries where there aren't a huge docket of cases to look on look at and and say well that's that's how i do it that's how i win yeah yes i see the problem so so you've just been recruited nick to the ghostbusters and you're sent in to help first news solve this what would you have told them to do you know with high insight now how would you have helped them yeah. uh to tackle this challenge what did they do wrong well i i don't know whether they did or didn't do any of these steps but i think one of the first steps now is is and what most companies have is um a team who look at the online world and and decide how to issue what's called uh, notices to have content removed from platforms and if you read the terms the user terms most e-commerce marketplaces now have a system you have to follow their rules so that means following let's say lazada vietnam's rules on on filing the notices in the right format uh, and they will then in theory remove the illegal content 
but that requires resources, time and effort. And not every company has got that in place you know big companies have teams of people and outside specialists doing it for them but smaller companies often have to learn how to do that on their own yeah so and that's the starting point yes right i see so investment in in knowledge in in people uh, so that you can monitor the market um if if you were to to do that for a company like such as first news what kind yeah. of budget are you needing to set aside for for this kind of work I mean, I know that's a very broad question. It's hard yeah, to but it does depend just... how big the problem is uh, and how many notices you have to issue. There are there are companies in Europe that you can hire to automate this, uh, quite a number of them, actually. They will run a program, and some of them target, they actually specialize in marketing to SMEs, so they work for SMEs and help mm -hmm. them remove illegal content around the world. It is, unfortunately, a reality of the modern internet world that copy goods counterfeit goods fake content is all visible even in sitting in headquarters when i started doing this work it wasn't people didn't know what was going on in, in the, on the far side of the world however they do now and therefore software companies help run these kind of processes to survey the the internet all over the world platforms all across asia they've got linguistic translation capabilities and they can do surveys and say well here here's the problem in that country mm. you know if you've got sales there you know let's 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 issue some notices and get some of this taken down if you don't have yeah it's a question about whether you want to spend that money yeah i i, I this isn't the topic for today but i suppose even ai image recognition, the ability exactly. to put note uh, logos on these sites quickly to then prepare a, 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 an almost AI generated legal letter sent directly to the to the seller saying you're infringing, please remove that's this. Right. That's what yeah, you mean by right. notice, isn't it? Uh, yeah, notice, the notice, is a, the notice will cite the, the listing in the, on the platform and say this listing, which can be exactly as you say, the, the image recognition software that's used to spot pictures of counterfeit goods or suspect listings let's say mm -hmm. but it's that's not enough because often the, the the counterfeiter will use a photograph of the genuine goods so sometimes you need to do a trap purchase which has to be done locally you know you, you do a test buy of the product and say okay well this this is definitely fake so then you send the notice in yeah there's yes, a sort yes. of well known process to do that now that maybe mm -hmm. uh wasn't around sort of before the pandemic as widely available yeah, right. Super, Nick. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, this is our Hollywood uh, episode, and we are trying to uh, to scare people a little bit, but it's not all bad news. And so I, I want us to take us on to our, our second case study now, uh, which had a different outcome, and, and that's a coup d'etat. Um, coup d'etat versus, well, coup d'etat Indonesia, Bali versus coup d'etat Singapore, I guess is how it would present it. Could, could you tell us a little bit about what coup d'etat is and who these actors were? Yes, um, I suppose I would say that it's more usual to find a Singaporean company complaining about something called trademark piracy in Indonesia. But this is actually the reverse situation. Mm -hmm. This is about an Indonesian brand. So not copyright, like the last example, but this is about brands and trademarks. And this is about an Indonesian brand for a beach club in Bali called Coup d'etat, which opened in the late 90s and throughout the early 2000s became one of the premier beach clubs, certainly in Asia. Um, it it was opened by a group of people. Um, uh, they had a sort of loose partnership. Um, they made it a huge success. Some of them focused on one part of the business. Another one owned the underlying land. Another, you know, another people did you know different parts, marketing and sales and social media and so on. And they helped build this up and run the DJs that played there and the F and B, the very famous restaurants that operated inside it. It was right. tremendously successful. Still is today. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, one of the owners, um, well, they, they registered their trademark in Indonesia, and then the other one of the owners thought, well, this is quite a serious issue. We need to start thinking about building our brand up internationally. And he went off and registered them in his own name in other parts of the world. Mm -hmm. um, it's a very long and convoluted story, but essentially, um, the trademarks got lost because of the number of transfers and different companies that that ended up owning trademarks. They got split. The Indonesian one remained in the in in the owner's name, what the mm -hmm. local owner's name, and then the, the other ones overseas. The business in Indonesia didn't seem, I guess, very interested in a global expansion. So just a lack of cooperation and and planning and uh, communication between the partners led to some of the overseas trademarks being sold off 
Right, I see. Mm -hmm. and, and that led in turn to um, a group of people uh, raising some funding, um, selling uh, shares in this new business that they created, including a company in Singapore called Coup d'Etat Singapore. Um, and they then launched a, essentially a Coup d'Etat beach club. It wasn't identical, but it was it had the same brand on the top of the biggest, most famous uh, hotel in in Singapore, the Marina Bay Sands Resort which is now an iconic image that you see about Singapore. The Grand Prix mm. goes past it. Yes, and so right yes. on the rooftop was a new coup d'etat. Yeah, I'm familiar with it. I've never been, but the, the, the images of it, the photos of it, I've seen many, many times. And so it's it's quite an audacious place to to throw up a, a, what is, you know, a, a trademark a infringement and to, to steal the name of another company and then to put it on top of one of the most famous hotels on the world. They were going to get noticed. Um, it was going to turn up. Um, and so what then was the case brought forward? How did then how did that then materialize? Well, there were a lot of disputes in different places, but ultimately, um, and I should say before we get to that, the parties were no longer the owners of the business. So this is a different group of people. Investors have bought it. They raised venture capital from a company called L Capital, which was one of the uh, Louis Vuitton venture arms. So they raised money and they but and they definitely owned the trademark. So it was, I suppose you'd say it was a speculative venture gamble that they could try and get away with mm -hmm. doing what the owners of Coulettin hadn't done. And maybe there had been discussions for all I know, you know, they tried to license and, and get the rights to leverage it and build something up worldwide. Clearly the brand was big enough for that possibility to arise. But mm. um Essentially, there were court cases in a couple of places, and finally it all went came to a head in Singapore because that's where this first launch of the competing beach club took place, and it went to the Singapore courts and eventually ended up in the Court of Appeal where mm. there was a sort of dual court case. One, uh, one part of it was that the Singapore trademark should be invalidated or returned, and the other part was that this was an infringement of the, of the rights. Now, Singapore is a common law country, which it means it's based on British law, and it means that you can have rights in unregistered trademarks in, 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 in effect. There is something equivalent in civil law called unfair competition, but this was because it was a Singapore case, it was called... Um, you know, these unregistered common law rights was the basis and eventually they won mm, but right okay <laughs> the, uh, so it's not all scary i mean it's obviously not it was... all scary unless you got the bill for that lawsuit yes i was just going to say i mean a lot of time lost a lot of investment in terms of hiring lawyers and everything else but it does show that there is legal recourse and that legal recourse can be successful exactly and singapore is a developed market with a you know a very strong legal system they would have they local solicitors to deal with it who would have in turn hired barristers um it would have been a tremendously expensive case uh for the people that were paying for it they did recover damages and some costs i believe so they would have recovered at least some or most of their money and then they've of course recovered all of the trademarks that they'd essentially lost over those years yes okay so a, a good ending to the story i wonder you, you when we started out that this this show you 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 highlighted the difference between the different countries and how that is possibly the scariest part that you go into the region and there are different things to trip over in different areas do you think this case had it been tried in indonesia would have had the same outcome do you think it was the the singaporean legal certainty if you like legal structure that helped um, that helped um, the, the original owners of the, the coup d'etat trademark to, to win this? Was it by picking the fight in Singapore? I think that's, that. well, they were forced by the fact that it was it, 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 it was in the Marina Bay Sands. They almost had to end up there and mm -hmm. to bring the case. But you're right, if they tried to bring this in another case based on unfair competition rights, that would possibly have been more challenging. Um, it's the fact that Singapore has these unregistered rights that are very strong that possibly gave them a bit of an advantage. And there was there, there was some arguments around what's called an implied partnership because the individuals had, hadn't structured themselves back in the early days as a business. And they were essentially operating as a, a virtual partnership. And the mm. law around that is very fuzzy. 
and it, it you can kind of do it in a place like Singapore because Singapore has the ability to draw on common law, which kind of means the law from the UK, from Australia, New Zealand, Malaysia, and that body of law builds up over time like layers, and and that makes it a little bit easier to be able to look back and say, well, there's cases from other parts of the world we can rely on. You can't do that in civil law jurisdictions like Philippines, Thailand, Vietnam, Indonesia, for example. So it does make it a lot more uncertain. You're right. Mm, I see. Uh, just something that comes to mind, um, given that, you know, these cross-border disputes are, are only going to grow into the future. I mean, I can just see that companies that are in many countries are going to be looking for one court to, 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 to have these arguments in. Is there a chance, because of course, ASEAN is trying to, to merge together and to create, you know, some sort of common legal basis, some sort of common policy basis in some areas. Is there a chance that that's, that's, that's going to happen in the future? There will be these, a bit Not, like the ECJ. Um, uh, well, I, I think the court level is a bit further away. I think the first step that they're trying to figure out um, is, uh, this is the ASEAN uh, economic community, um, mm. they're trying to figure out if they can build a regional trademark system first and foremost. There is an international trademark system called the Madrid system, mm. but that basically creates a bundle of national applications. So it still leaves you in the same boat as having lots of national applications. ASEAN is looking at and has been exploring for a long time whether a single trademark or group of trademarks could be registered through a common platform in Southeast Asia. And it's back on the agenda now. I was at a re recent government meeting, uh, intergovernmental meeting in, in Southeast Asia, where they said, no, this is back on the agenda again. There's a mm -hmm. test uh, being run by the Philippines IP office to see if they could build a, a, a sort of common filing system that would work across all the countries. If that was to happen, you could get a single trademark for all of ASEAN, then that would then remove, much like the European trademark theoretically does, um, mm. removes the fact that you have to have one registration for every country, which leads to this problem if, if you forget a country or you're not allowed in another one country, you may not have all your rights in place. Yeah, of course, that would that would obviously give a lot of confidence to people going into the region if that was in place. Um, and in e-commerce, I mean, given we, we, we've highlighted the scale of the e-commerce problem, are there common attempts to deal with this e-commerce, uh, trademark infringement, uh, copyright theft? Uh, there are. Um, I would say it's not as well developed as the, as the discussion around having a common trademark system uh, for the simple reason that it's just newer. And uh, the ASEAN IP offices are trying to get their heads around, around this. And there isn't a, uh, a common uh, enforcement authority a network of, yeah. of enforcement which is crucial, authorities, isn't it? Of course, yes, is absolutely different, and it's difficult mm. even in Europe because even in Europe, for example, criminal law is not harmonised across the whole region. Much the same in ASEAN, the enforcement systems are not as well harmonised as the registration systems. But mm -hmm. you know, it's on the agenda, and you know, again at this meeting the other day, I was out. I heard them discussing how they would like to address e-commerce enforcement and try and get some common standards in place, uh, which the which Europe has has done in recent years, for example. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Dick. That's very interesting. We we got a little bit off topic there in terms of what the future could hold, but I still think it's it's interesting to discuss these things. Maybe a lot of our audience are maybe involved in some of these discussions and can put pressure themselves nationally or or internationally. Yeah. Um, we're starting to come come to the end. I just wanted to open up uh, to a couple of questions that we've received. Um, one in particular is just to, for you to summarize, if you like, you know, what are the real lessons to draw from these. So, you know, one of the SMEs listening to us now is thinking about taking that first step. What, what should they do before they, they they really try to sell their products or services in the region? What are the what are the ABCs of trying to set up in the area? Yeah, I mean, the first one, it's very basic, but you, you cannot um, under, <laughs> cannot overestimate the importance of it, is getting trademarks registered. That is the source of many problems if you don't have your marks registered or you've waited a long time to register your marks, you run the risk of not being able to secure a registration. Without a registration, not even an application, it takes it can take a year to get a registration after you've applied. You need the registration to file that notice with the e-commerce platform saying, please remove the illegal content. So that's the you know, number one step. Uh, register as soon as you can, uh, plan ahead, 
before don't wait until you're sort of about to hire a distributor and and say sell my mm-hmm. goods think months and months in advance when you're first thinking about should i even find one how do i find one that's when you need to start thinking about registering your trademarks the reality is every one knows every trademark in the world now uh, there's there's an infringer in your business sector copying people in southeast asia and they may you know nab one of your trademarks and that's the sort of scenario not quite the same as the coup d'etat situation, but perhaps more common for foreign companies. They arrive and they find someone who's registered one of their trademarks. Um, the coup d'etat example gives another lesson, which is register them in your name. Make sure that you, the corporate entity it, 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 that runs your business in your headquarter country, that is the entity that must register the marks. Don't put it in personal names. Don't allow your partners to put it in their names. Don't let your distributor do it. You know, that's how the coup d'etat problem arose. They hadn't got a corporate entity set up to own their trademarks and consistently in the same country, uh, uh, same company name. I don't know how the first news challenge arose, um, but I won't be surprised if the wrong company was filing the lawsuit. That's a typical problem. You've got to have a, a single company that owns the rights and brings all the actions. Yes, right. And so this is what the SME help desk, you know, that that, 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 that is hosting today's show, you know, is all about. It's about providing some of this early advice. Um, I suppose knowledge on the ground is important as well. You've talked about, you know, obviously registering a trademark, absolutely. Making sure legally that registration is sound and solid and can can deal with any, um, you know, future contests. Um but, but, you know, if I'm going for the first time to do business in Vietnam, I'm going in there very, very naive. Uh, h- how important is it to find those partners, you know, that you hire um, in country? Mm. Yeah. I mean, in terms of finding IP lawyers, there are directories, there are places to go to find them. You can talk to the SME help desk. There's ways to get advice. Um, it's kind of important to do that uh, before you sort of go to start trading, make sure you've got some expert advice. If you're not sure, you can also talk to the chambers of commerce in the country. There will be a chamber of commerce, a European chamber of commerce in almost every country. Many of them produce IP reports as well. So you can actually get access to some local expertise that way, as well as through the SME help desk as well. So there are sources of information available. Um, You will have to use a local lawyer to register a trademark. That's critical. You can't do it from overseas much in the same way as an Asian company needs to do that in Europe. So that's just mm. the way of doing business. Yes. Okay. Great. And, uh, another question has come in that I think is, 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 is interesting. Um, so it says it's, there are, there are different legal systems and economies in Southeast Asia, Singapore, highly developed as we've touched upon Vietnam, maybe less so. So you've just given some broad strategies there for how to engage with the region, but how does this play into IP strategies and really? So do different countries need different approaches? Now, I'm not asking you to, to go through all of the countries now, but but some of the different or some yeah. of the extra um, pieces of advice you would give if you were to go into one country or the other. Yes. I mean, this goes a little bit back to the discussion at the beginning. There are There are different sized, different focused economies they have different sort of strengths and weaknesses um, an energy company might be very focused on indonesia because that's a huge energy source uh, of you know, oil and gas and so on and uh, whereas if you're manufacturing maybe you're choosing to manufacture in thailand or vietnam uh, or malaysia uh, where there's perhaps a more developed manufacturing sector um there are lots of IP issues to consider when you're entering a market. If you're manufacturing, you're going to tend to think about your trade secrets, possibly your patents. If you're using technology, copyright, if it's software, there might be things mm. that you need to take a lot more care because you're essentially giving away the expertise and knowledge you've built up in your company to a manufacturer to help produce your goods. So you have to put contracts in place. Maybe there are more registrations needed, more focus on IP needed in that kind of market than say, I don't know, a sales market like uh, where you're where you're not present. So I mean, this yeah. is a generalization, but if you were just selling into the Philippines and didn't just had a distributor, you'd register your trademark, but you might, you'd have a contract with your distributor and maybe a license, but maybe not, not a lot more is needed than that. So you've got mm. different kind of issues for different regions and Singapore tends to be a regional hub. So you might even have a, a staff member base there. Many companies will put someone there on contract or on a permanent staff, have a rep office or whatever. 
they can even be doing R&D potentially in places. There are, there are certain sectors like F&B where you can partner with some of the local universities in Singapore. So there's different sort of as aspects to think about for different countries. And yeah, it's not one size fits all, unfortunately. Yeah, Nick, thank you very much. This is all really excellent. And I and I hope that, um, as I say, our, our audience today is, is getting a lot out of it. I think that uh, our point today, because we fell on Halloween, was a little bit to to, to, to put the heebie-jeebies in people to to make them, you know, scared. But ultimately, we're here to to to, to provide some 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 advice, uh, to provide some confidence in going to the end. And I I think that you've definitely done that today. Um, so I really wanted to thank you for your time, um, Nick. Thank I you. think that's been very informative, in particular um, in those two countries that have been the focus today. Um, so as we come to, to the end of today's podcast, I just wanted to say a massive thanks again, Nick, for joining us and, and to our audience. Um, if you missed any of this podcast, we will be posting it shortly onto our YouTube channel. This is our IP Espresso channel. Um, now, if you want more information on how to protect your innovations in Southeast Asia, how to protect your trademarks, uh, please do visit the website that I, I mentioned at the start of the show. I'll do it again now. It's www.sea-iphelpdesk.eu. That's www.sea-iphelpdesk.eu. Dot eu. Um, you can submit your questions to our IP experts on there. Ba those experts are based in Southeast Asia. They know Southeast Asia very, very well. You can also download many fact sheets about intellectual property in the region. So I do recommend you visit that site. Um, finally, we would love to know your thoughts about this podcast. Now, in the closing titles that appear shortly, um, there will be a QR code uh, that will link you through to our feedback survey. We'd be very grateful if you could just take a minute to share your views with us. Um, so we can make sure that we provide more of what you want going forward. Um, that's it. Thank you very much for sharing your time with us today. My apologies for the slight technical glitches at the start of the show. Um, do look out for when we'll announce our next show, which will appear on uh, our social media channels. And uh, enjoy Halloween and bye for now.